everyone, welcome back to Alkaline Hydroxide 784 and today in the history series we'll be looking at Paper 1, Team 3. So for Paper 1, Team 3 we'll be looking at the ICJ because yeah, I think my Team 3 was a bit messy. <laughs> and the thing is for this particular team my notes are actually kind of just the stuff that I wrote down <laughs> from tutorial and I kind of like and also the actual notes that we got. So there is a bit of, there's quite a lot of influence from the school notes and the tutorial based notes. So yeah, I can get to see that today. So let's go to the document now. So in the document, we can see that we have, um, you know, this wonderful little title here, International Court of Justice, if you don't know what ICJ means. And just for quick reference, IL is actually referring to international law because that's too long to type. Um, I realize there's actually some mistakes here in terms of the exact facts, so if there's anything I want to correct, I'll correct it on the spot. Okay, so the question that this, these notes are based on is how successful was the ICJ in fulfilling its role between 1945 and 2000? And actually this question is a useful enough question to base your notes on because some of the points can be used to also say other things about the ICG or mostly they'll just be asking this kind of thing about ICG on its particular role in the sense. So yeah, it's a pretty useful question. Uh, th yeah, this is actually based in terms of an essay structure like there's the preamble, the criteria and all that stuff. Yeah, it's is the main idea. So in terms of criteria, what what the criteria for this particular question would be the impact of what the ICJ did, like what's the goal versus what they actually managed to do, and how the cases they handled went, like whether they went well or whether it was just dismissed, and also the constraints that they faced because even though the ICJ is pretty powerful, Okay, actually no, it's not that powerful. <laughs> That's the part, the part where it's not so powerful because there's bigger powers that constrain what it can do. So we cannot keep blaming the ICJ because there are also other things that limit its effectiveness. And also the time period in which it, like maybe in different time period, it was more successful. And in another one, it probably less successful. And also the different perspectives. Like some would feel that ICJ is not going, doing a good job and others would feel like it's doing a good job as we'll see here soon. And because the, the main reason for this is that the ICJ was a western construct. And as you can see a lot of the cases are actually from the first world countries and some of them involve the third world countries as well. But not a lot of them involve the USSR countries or the so-called second world, if you want to say that. Right, so what's the role of the ICJ? The role of the ICJ is to uphold and maintain international peace and security through the judiciary adjudic adjudicating roles and through advisory opinion. So what that means is the ICJ is like this, um, it's like a court, but for big countries to you know, battle each other because normal courts work within a country's rules but the ICJ is like an international version of a court so it's a bit easier for different countries to you know face each other off in the court yeah so what are the, the perspectives that we are looking at uh, the first one is the Western perspective which is because the West was the one that established the international law as I mentioned just now different countries have different laws so if the West is the one who developed the so-called international law. Is it really international law? <laughs> oh well. Mm. Yeah, so to the West, this is, they are, they are fine with the ICJ because they are the one who made it, in a sense. Uh, and the way, of course, we, we can also argue that the Second World and Third World did have opportunities to influence the international law, but they just didn't. Maybe because they had their own problems to deal with and yeah, this just how it is. <laughs> so for the Second World, aka the USSR and you know those like all the communist countries, they kind of rejected the Western perspective because they feel like the Western states are all capitalists and also they need a reason to you know be against the West. <laughs> and 
yeah, they didn't really participate in the end, even though they were not exactly excited about it. Right, so meanwhile, the third world, what did they do? Basically, all the so-called poor countries, I suppose, um, they felt like they didn't participate, but they were forced to accept the law. I'm not sure they actually did get an opportunity to participate because I'm not involved in this, so yeah. But but the thing is, they couldn't really get involved until the 1960s because that's when they actually joined the UN. And by then, the IL was already quite established. And instead of uh, trying to, to adjust the existing international law, they wanted to come up with a totally new one. You know, it's a bit like how they wanted to do the NIEO. Here, they also wanted a new world order. And they didn't want the West to be perpetuating new co colonialism, which means that Colonialism is where the country act directly goes and invades another country and uh, controls it. But in neo-colonialism, it's a bit like an indirect influence where they influence it economically or they have like they have some kind of control, but it's very subtle and quite distant, like an indirect kind of control. Even though the actual countries do have their own government and are very independent. <laughs> Actually, they're not as independent as we realize. Okay. Right, so... Um, right, so the very first instance of international law of sorts would be in Westphalia. And, um, yeah, that was very long ago, so you, you don't really need to talk about it. But the fact that it, the very first incidence of international law of some sort was done somewhere in Europe already shows us that a lot of the things that happen today are quite controlled by the Western world. So yeah, uh, as you can see, even this current so-called international law is by the Western world and the second and third world didn't accept it and they felt like their interests were not taken into account. So that's the first part of this thing, which is the perspective. So the second part of looking at the ICJ was the actual cases. So for ICJ, there are five very important case studies that you must remember no matter what. And I'll be going through them now. <laughs> so the first one is the USA versus the Nicaragua case. And that is, it literally shows us just how much of a um, terrible thing the USA can be sometimes. I'm trying to be polite. <laughs> you, you know what I mean. Yeah, so... Uh... Right. So the details are as such. In 1984, we have the people in Nicaragua basically fighting against each other. So we have the Sardinistas. And um, the thing is, they are not the ones supporting the contrast, but the US was the one supporting the contrast. Uh, yeah, against the contrast, I guess, I suppose. Wait, let me just adjust this. Uh, against the contrast. And the U.S. decided to support the contrast because they were more aligned with the U.S. willing, the U.S. perspective of you know non-communism or non-socialism per se. And because the U.S. purposely went and helped the contrast and helped them be the rebel and do all this stuff in Nicaragua, which doesn't make sense to Nicaragua because no one asked the U.S. to help, if you think about it that way. So because of this, the Nicaragua was not exactly happy about it and filed a suit against the US in the ICJ. And the US defense was that, oh, we are, we are helping, the con we're helping to enforce collective self-defense. Like we're just helping them with their self-defense. Yeah, yeah, totally. Uh, they are definitely not trying to, you know, overthrow the Sardinistas out. Uh, at all like we are traditionally not trying to impose our own interests totally okay uh, and as we see that ICJ is actually a pretty unbiased party it ruled in favor of Nicaragua because it respects Nicaragua's sovereignty but even though ICJ did a good thing the US did made things worse because like it, it told US not to put any mines or do any unlawful force because of course USA was in the wrong and the only reason why it failed was because of US <laughs> the US refu refused to accept jurisdiction and obviously it didn't participate in future proceeding proceedings 
And the reason why it could actually do that is because uh, US is one of the main people in the UN, I suppose. You know, it's in the SE and that's why it can veto things like this. And also, it, the US withdrew from compulsory jurisdiction, which is such a terrible thing to have started to begin with. Like, to allow countries to just withdraw from this is not very helpful for the ICJ. Even though the ICJ is good at giving decisions, it does not have a lot of power because, as you can see, the US has way more power than the ICJ. So the US really just, you know, made things really bad here. So let's go and look at something else that does not involve the US. <laughs> right, okay. Uh, so the second one is the Kofu Channel Dispute. Yes, the channel is called the Kofu Channel. Very interesting name. I don't know what to say about that. Uh, and it is between the UK and Albania. So in 1947 to 1949, that's the time period. Do remember all the years and stuff for at least these five cases because you know you have you need some sort of detail. So I will put in quotation marks details. So yeah, this is the detail you need, <laughs> and also the actual story that's going on that detail as well. So in 1946, Albania was fighting with Greece and then it decided to put some mines in the Corfu Channel because it was fighting with Greece, so yeah, it's, it's so-called defense. And the problem is the British warships wanted to use that area to pass through because I think there's not a lot of places to go and you know sail through the water or anything. And they're just passing through and the problem is the mines ran and killed the wrong people. <laughs> so <laughs> because of that, UK was like, can we, can we like actually go through the water without dying? <laughs> so they need peaceful pass passageway through the waters and they told the ICJ. And then the ICJ told, look Albania, you shouldn't you know, just be putting mines and not telling UK. And it was successful because you know Albania is in USA, so yeah, it was successful. <laughs> and also Al to Albania, this wasn't a big deal, so, so it's like, it doesn't hurt its sovereignty or do anything crazy. So it was fine with the wording, I suppose. So, yeah, actually there's another factor which is whether the wording would affect the country, like how, what's the extent to which it would affect the country. So that could also affect whether the thing is successful, so do take note of it. If the thing involves very small, trivial things like fishing and, you know, just putting mines in some random location, it doesn't affect your sovereignty, then it's okay. But if it's something that actually affects your sovereignty or affects another country's sovereignty, it is a big deal and therefore the countries are less likely to accept the jurisdiction that the ICJ gives. Okay, the verdict that ICJ gives. Right, so let's look at the next one, which is uh, Burkina Faso versus Mali. So there was there's this little border in the in world of these countries and there's a little war over this uh, Agashe strip thingy which had a lot of resources which makes sense they want resources so you're having a little war with that and um, you know they were kind of unhappy about the whole situation so instead of having a continuing the war they decided to go to ICJ and the ICJ did the most interesting thing which was to just split the territory equally great that was the best solution and it worked because it satisfied both of them and of course, there was no USA, so it definitely worked. <laughs> okay, I'm just kidding. That doesn't mean it works for all countries that, do, that aren't USA. There are some that still are a bit... Hmm. Yeah, okay, never mind. So it was a win-win situation in this scenario. Okay, so the next one is the Iranian hostage crisis. Oh no, look, there's a USA once again. And once again, it didn't succeed. Oh my gosh. Okay, sorry. <laughs> Okay, just kidding. It's, I'm not sure if it's because of the USA, but you, you get the idea. So this one was in November 1979 to January 1981. So there was this hostage crisis because Iran is of course always against the US and they were holding some US people hostage in Tehran. And actually it wasn't even the government, it was the students there who were doing it. And the government was, you know, uh, supposedly promised to protect these people from getting hostage to begin with and they didn't do that so and they weren't interested in the situation because I'm pretty sure the government actually likes this so uh, the Iranian government that is 
So the US wasn't exactly happy about this whole situation because Iran wasn't helping and they put a bunch of sanctions on Iran and in this time the ICJ ruled in favor of US because of course Iran was being quite, you know, uh, sneaky in the way it was doing things and not exactly helping the US people escape. And it, um, yeah, the ICJ ordered Iran to release the hostage and give them protection. But the thing is, it didn't succeed. And um, this is because of the fact that the whole situation involves a bunch of students and not the actual government directly. So the, so the fact that there are non-state actors in this crisis probably led to a problem and it made it harder for for the government and also it made it easier for the government to act, not actually do stuff you know what I mean and the main, it made it harder for them to do stuff and in the end they didn't succeed and it ended up just the crisis on its own just ended and it got removed from the list somehow so yeah it's not always the US's fault as we have seen here but the US can be one of the reasons why things fail <laughs> please don't write that in your essay though please don't write oh the US is the reason why things why the ICJ failed no, please don't write that. That's a terrible idea. Okay, uh, and the last one is South Africa versus Southwest Africa. So by Southwest Africa, we're looking at Ethiopia and Liberia. So what happened is in 1960 to 66, um, you know, South Africa was violating something in Southwest Africa. Actually, in Namibia, it's not even Ethiopia or Liberia. It was Namibia that it was doing stuff in. And it refused to put Southwest Africa under UN trusteeship. There was like a bunch of issues like ap apartheid and stuff like that. And for some reason, even though the country involved was Namibia, Ethiopia and Liberia were the ones who brought this to ICJ. So I'm just confused. <laughs> so uh, the ICJ kind of rejected their claims. And um, yeah, they weren't, they weren't like... The ICJ didn't really want to believe Ethiopia and Liberia because it seems just a bit weird. The whole situation is very weird, actually. And um, they weren't willing to consider South Africa's actions as apartheid. The problem is, the is, you can see this context here. The white people were in parliament, so that's about as much apartheid as they had. And apparently that wasn't enough for the ICJ, so it didn't succeed and I have no idea what happened. Please don't ask me. I think you should probably just look at it yourself if you have the notes. <laughs> I think you understand it more than I do. Okay, so since you know this thing is too confusing, let's look at some other case studies that are a lot easier to remember. Or at least a bit easier to talk about at least. Yeah. So the first thing is of course a fishery case, which is what I was talking about. If it involves fisheries, it's a lot easier to resolve because it's just fish and not your land or sovereignty and that's why it kind of worked so you can read the details yourself right so the next one is the yeah this one this is actually a bit of an interesting case because this is related to the temple uh, I don't want to pronounce it because I'm scared I'll say it wrongly <laughs> and uh, this is a very important temple that's why it is involved in this whole situation and it was in like this border area and Thailand and Cambodia were not you know like wanted some kind of claim over the temple and the ICJ gave it to Cambodia in um, 9, 1959 to 1962 time and the thing is it was actually okay peace and quiet at least until 2008 yes I saw the news in 2008 I remember it so yeah okay cool they had like this huge graphic and whatnot I, I don't know what it looks like okay <laughs> and then another one here which is um, Australia and New Zealand versus France and apparently this one was about <laughs> uh, France having tests in the Pacific Ocean and you know Australia and New Zealand are there in the Pacific Ocean and they weren't exactly happy about it the problem is by the time ICJ did anything, the thing, the problem already disappeared. So, you know that was pretty stupid. <laughs> it's like a bit stupid, like this. This actually blaming the ICJ now because ICJ is a bit slow. Right. Okay. So now let's look at the points that you can get. From
from these cases and from the general points that you can get from the ICJ. So the best approach is to either just tell all of this at once and then all of this at once or you can do a point by point comparison like agree with but agree with but that kind of thing. So here's this huge table that you can look at. Let's look at them look at that now. Okay, so uh, I'll probably do the agree rebut stuff because there is actually points on both sides for most of them. So you could say that the ICJ was generally successful because it was like a pro forum and it was quite predictable. You can actually predict what they're gonna say, and even the small states could do stuff like could get some the case hurt in the ICJ, and it's also a peaceful alternative to war. You know, like war is dangerous and kills people. In ICJ, you just talk to each other and even if it feels at least you didn't kill anyone. <laughs> yeah, so that's the point. Okay, so that's the first point and for not successful, this is not something you can really rebut. It's just a very generic statement. So let's look at the next one. So the next one is that it represents the sovereign states, but because it's based on sovereign states, it excludes all the non-state actors like any companies, people, literally anyone who is not like a government or a country per se or a state per se, you know what I mean? Yeah. So it's the problem is even though it is of course the point of it being an ICJ is for to allow countries to go against each other. But the, pro the reality is much more complicated and it's not just countries going against each other. It could be a country versus a company, it could be a country versus a bunch of people. So it may not always be two countries going against each other. And that scenario isn't considered in the ICJ and that kind of prevents certain cases from being resolved fully because it involves non-state act actors and that kind of causes a lot of extra unpredictability. Right, so... So in the sense, uh, so the next point is on the number of cases. The ITJ actually handled 119 cases, which seems pretty good, right? But the problem is it's not exactly impressive in reality because there were a lot of new member states in the UN and there's a overinflation of the number of cases, especially because we have US being a defiant thing. And there were some that were involving multiple countries versus one single country. So there is that, that thing ends up adding to many cases. So in reality, the number of cases is like, if you want to really look at it in actual separate cases, it probably wouldn't be 119, but a smaller number. And also the fact that there's an uneven spread of cases because most of the cases were before 1962. And after that, the number of cases were actually only one or even zero cases per year. So in the end, ICJ has no work to do, <laughs> apparently. So yeah, there is that uneven spread of cases. So this 119 is not the best um, way to look at its success because we have to look at whether it is still successful after a period of time. Like it maybe was had a lot of cases in the early days, but after a period of time, it became less and less important or like the less and less cases that were being looked at in the sense, yeah. So the next part is on the range of cases. So you might say, oh look, there's a lot of different cases. There's fishery, there's border dispute, there's channel incidents, and there's also an increasing number of cases after 1985. Okay, so in between 1962 and 1985, there wasn't a lot, but after 1985, there's slightly more cases. Uh, slightly more, like not as great as before 1962, but at least slightly more. And also we have the USSR finally breaking up and, you know, participating in international law. So we have a bit more stuff in 1990s and, you know, giving them a bit more work to do. But the problem is, as much as we like talking about fisheries and border disputes and all that, these are actually quite trivial stuff. Like, they're not very vital or they're pretty trivial and not very sovereignty related. And when they do a sovereignty related case, it usually fails. So that's the main point. And in terms of the absolute numbers, it's not that impressive it's only okay in if you compare it with before 1985 which was even worse so yeah it's not that great it's just a normal 
small number. <laughs> you know what I mean? So the next part is about the compulsory jurisdiction. Of course, they had many states that were actually accepting the, the compulsory jurisdiction, which means that they can willingly bring their cases for arbitration and they're willing to let ITJ decide things for them. But even though it was many, that many wasn't a lot. <laughs> there were only one third of the members that actually accepted completely like, as compulsory jurisdiction. Others either didn't accept it or they included optional or exemption clauses. For example, we have our wonderful USA having the Connolly Amendment, which allowed them to basically, you know, eat themselves out of the Nicaragua case. Yeah. So this allows them to, like, this allows states to basically, you know, mess up any case that involves sovereignty and then prevent a certain verdict from happening. So yeah, that's with regards to the next point, which is whether the states accept the verdict. Of course, some states definitely do accept it, especially in trivial cases as we saw. But not all of them will accept it, especially when you have the USA. Not all of them are going to accept the verdict. And there's also, and it's even more the case when there's sovereignty involved, when that means, you know, if their sovereignty is at stake, they probably may not accept the verdict, especially the US. <laughs> Uh, actually, no, the US doesn't really care about its own sovereignty because usually its sovereignty isn't threatened, but you know, when stuff like that is involved, they can basically just ignore the verdict big time. So, the next point would be that without the ICJ, the situation would be worse, like we will have even more chaos in this world. But isn't that a bit counterfactual? You might ask because, uh, is it really? <laughs> I mean, without the ICJ, you probably just find another way to do it again. So it's not like, yeah, it's not like the ICJ is that great of a thing on its own. Yeah, like probably the countries could deal with it on their own, you know, like the two of them could talk to each other and deal with it. So it's not like the ICJ is the thing that made the situation better. It's more of the fact that the countries realize that there's a need to actually solve the situation that made it better, you know what I mean? Yeah. So it's a bit counterfactual and not the best point, but you can still write it down if you want. Okay, so the next point is the fact that ICJ had a lot of constraints. As we mentioned just now, we have US who is way more powerful than ICJ. And a lot of countries have their sovereignty and national interests, which would prevent ICJ from being able to successfully do certain things. And you can't just completely blame the ICJ because it's literally just some, like, you know, it's, it's supposed to be this impartial body, and it is. It is pretty impartial at doing what it's trying to do. But it's a bit hard to do stuff when there's a lot of other um, factors, especially when you have the UN itself being not super impartial in the sense. So it's a bit problematic in the sense, like the such structural limitations of its power. Like, yeah, the structural limitations to its power is kind of what leads to it having a lot of trouble with um, having successful cases. So under that situation, the fact that it still manages to have successful cases means that it is a bit of a success, right? So that is a fair argument. This is one of the stronger arguments you can talk about. But you must be aware that even though there are constraints, it is the ICJ after all. It is an international court of justice. It should be able to work around at least some of the constraints. So that means it, it definitely doesn't have enough ability slash power to work again around the constraints, which means it wasn't so successful after all. So that's one way you could rebut that argument. Okay, so the next point here is... Um, okay, so you can look at the intangible impact of the ICJ rather than, you know, the, the, like, the very specifics of the cases and everything. So the intangible impact is like the fact that countries are more willing to be open to discussion and less likely to just go and fight against each other immediately. Instead, they, they, have, they have this option to go to a court. So it's a bit more of a generic intangible impact and that is it is a good thing, you know, like, it's good that the countries are more likely to be more diplomatic about what their own problems and not just, you know, immediately come to hasty war decisions in a sense. So yeah, this could be a fair argument, although there's not, there's not much to really say about it though. 
Right. Um, and then the final thing is you can give your actual examples. You can talk about the successful cases and you can talk about the, you know, the unsuccessful cases. So you can say as many as you wish, but maybe try to have at least three on each side so that you have a decent amount of content. Or at least like, you can spread it out throughout the other points as well if you need a case in order to explain a point. Or you can put it separately or something like that. So that's up to you to decide how you want your essay to be structured. Right, so this is the main points that you can talk about with regards to the ICJ. And uh, some other things that you can note. Uh, first off, we have the politicized nature of ICJ decisions. Which means that the politics actually does influence some of the decisions that ICJ makes. And as I was saying, the ICJ is supposed to be an impartial uh, entity, but um, because of certain factors, sometimes it is not entirely impartial, or at least there is, even though it is somewhat an impartial decision, there is some politics behind it as well. So you might need to take note of that. And um, these are different kinds of out outcomes. Either is, oh my gosh, either it is successful, or if it was successful but the verdict was ignored. It couldn't even come up with a verdict because the problem disappeared, for example. And um, yeah, you can talk about the impact of the verdict because sometimes the fact that yeah maybe the verdict actually led to a more peaceful situation or it, or it led to a more volatile situation sometimes. And that could be helpful to explain your points as well on whether the ICJ was actually successful or a failure. So if you don't have enough time to write the, you know, your essay, you can shorten your, if for like for the less important arguments, you can write it a little bit shorter. Like you don't need to give all the individual details, and but you can more of like name drop the case a little bit and then just tell about the impact instead of the all the little details of the case. Yeah. So you can do that if you don't have enough time, because I think it's kind of acceptable in a sense. So other thing that you can look at when you're writing an essay is the change over time. For example, if you're talking about the number of cases we talk about the 60s versus the, sorry, before the 60s and then from 60s to 80s and then from 80s onwards, that kind of change over time. And also amongst different countries, whose cases were looked at the most, whose were not looked at at all, and across different factors as well. And that's one thing you can look at if you want to bring everything together in a better, more flowy sense. You can also look at continuity and change, what they constant, what change a lot, compare contrast, perspectives, all this stuff. So you can so you must definitely include all of this, especially the perspective because that is actually pretty easy to see that there's a perspective to begin with. So the conclusion is you talk about the thesis statement again, your basic your starting argument, and then um, you give a synthesis that ICJ Maybe not super successful, but not a complete failure either. It's a mixed bag of both. And even if the failures do end up overwhelming the success, at least it's, at least they did something. Despite, especially given that they had a lot of problems doing things, they had a lot of challenges. So the fact that they managed to do something was better than nothing. <laughs> so that that the idea of the conclusion, if you can come up with something better than do that, I guess. Yeah. So I think that's the end of this one. Um, yeah, we're done. So if you found this video useful, please press the like button and subscribe. And with that, I would like to say thank you and bye.